Thanks a bunch. I appreciate that. Uh, so thanks for coming out to my talk. Again, my name is Neil Peterson. I work with Microsoft in Azure. Uh, there's my Twitter handle if you want to reach out to me after the session. So this session is, you know, I titled it Governance in Kubernetes, uh, poly Policy-Driven Protection for Your Applications and Resources. And, and really, you know, well, well, before we get into this, I, I was in the last session, there was a couple hands, but who, who's working with Kubernetes at all? Like even just like, hello world? Okay, cool. So you know, really my intention here was, I mean, there is, you know, we see a lot of talks and there's a lot of, you know, focus on Kubernetes and, and kind of the way it's going to change the industry and uh, how it changes how we deploy and manage applications. And, you know, there, there's another layer to it that I don't think we talk about enough, and that is, you know, what does it take to run one of these things in production, um, <clears throat> particularly in a multi-tenanted environment? And, and we'll talk about multi-tenancy here. So that was really kind of the, the, the goal of this talk is to go beyond just like, the application aspects of Kubernetes, but really start digging into some of the operational aspects. Um, so, so really kind of like putting on that operator's hat and you know, how do I, you know, I'm not deploying applications, I'm, I'm looking after my Kubernetes cluster or clusters and uh, you know, my responsibility is, is making sure that uh, these clusters can facilitate the applications. Uh, so quickly, you know, the agenda, we're gonna talk about multi-tenancy. Um, <clears throat> Role-based access control, um, protecting nodes from resource thrashing, and what I mean by that is like, uh, you know, a particular workload consuming all of the memory uh, of the cluster, which then you know disables the ability for other applications to perform well. Um, controlling pod placement, uh, handling prioritized workload, and, and and we'll talk about these as we go through, and then just a, a quick bullet point on tooling. Uh, for policy management. Now, this is the very first time I've given this talk. Uh, I've talked about Kubernetes a lot. It's also the very first time I've talked about this kind of aspect of Kubernetes. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm either going to end early and we're going to have a lot of time for questions, or I'm not going to get through everything. Uh, but hopefully I do. Uh, I've got a few slides and a bunch of demos. Um, it's very YAML heavy. That's okay. You know, if, if you haven't worked with Kubernetes, I'll describe the concepts as we go. I've got diagrams that should help facilitate that as well. However, before, you know, before we get into the operational aspects of it, you know, I really wanted to talk about like, why do we have this conversation? You know, why, why do things change from like, you know, my old role of, of managing a data center in the very same way? And that's because Kubernetes you know, is fundamentally has the possibility of changing how we deploy applications and how applications run. You know, Kubernetes itself facilitates uh, new capabilities in application architecture, such as you know, burstable workloads, unpredictable workloads, and, and all of this happens at a very fast rate. Uh, one of my favorite kind of like when, when I'm giving like an introduction to Kubernetes talks, kind of one of the the things I reflect back on to kind of talk about the benefit of Kubernetes is. Uh, a consulting uh, gig that I did many, many, many years ago with a huge retail company in uh, the United States. And uh, we, had, we had virtualization, we had PowerShell, we had automation, you know, we thought we were really cool. And this organization, they wanted to build a system that when traffic spiked to their retail website, um, we would burst out virtual machines to give that traffic more compute power and you know we whiteboarded it and it made a lot of sense, and you know we proved a concept that it didn't make, and it worked. But but the reality was is that you know we couldn't spin those virtual machines up fast enough to meet the demands of the traffic, and and traffic doesn't always just spike just like that. I mean you'll have you know spikes like that, and and, and it just didn't work. Bottom line, Kubernetes, however, with containers and, and orchestration technology like this we can do things like that. Uh, so we can have you know, a Kubernetes cluster with a couple nodes and just really dynamic workload just bursting through the thing at rapid and unpredictable rates. And that's what we want. That's, that is some of the benefits that are allowing us to change the way we architect applications and gain efficiencies and, and work in different ways. So um, I'm gonna kind of set this up here with a diagram and we're gonna kind of use this through the rest of the talk. But what we have here is a 
Kubernetes cluster with three nodes, so three virtual machines, physical machines, whatever they might be. Each one of these uh, represents a pod. And then I've got, in this environment, I run three pieces of workload. I've got this pink one, which is kind of my ingestion API. Uh, if I'm a retail customer, this is my front end website. This is the critical one. Like, so through this talk, pink is like, this thing has to stay running. Like, no matter what, this is how we make our money. Uh, second one here, red, this is my order processing. Totally critical, but it's durable. Like, if this thing fails, it's okay. We'll bring it back up, and it will pick up back where it was. Potentially, you know, work comes in through the pink service, gets stuck on a queue. My red service is pulling stuff off of that queue. Well, if that red service goes away, that queue is just going to continue to build. Once my red service comes back, it's going to start to, you know, continue to pull off that queue. So, totally critical but durable. Like, I can, I can go without this thing for a couple minutes if, if necessary. And then I've got this blue service that's just, this is my other non-critical workload, people playing around, like some little tool, still, you know, important, but it's not the main focus of this cluster. And so let's just, let's just walk through a day in a life of this cluster. So we start up my non-critical stuff. All right, my critical app is running. And orders start coming in, boom. My cluster is just like totally freaking consumed. No, no big, you know, we'll talk about how to deal with that. And that's kind of the point here. Like how do we deal with situations like this? Orders are going down, I'm processing them. Okay, that's fine. We decided we need more instances of the critical application, so we bring those up. Boom, all of a sudden my cluster is, you know, slammed again. Um, so, you know, the, the point of this is I really just kind of want to like, walk through a day in the life of a super busy, unpredictable Kubernetes cluster. And, and, you know, and we'll talk about some of the benefits of Kubernetes. And the benefit is, you know, one of the benefits of a cluster like this is really using all that white space. I don't want a bunch of white space. White space means resources that are just sitting there unused. I do want to be able to like slot work into all of these spots, but I need to think about things like that critical workload and that durable workload and how do I manage those. Um, so that was kind of just setting the stage. Uh, what's not covered in this talk? So, you know, I had this situation of there's, this is a big topic. We've got 45 minutes. <laughs> so I, I decided to kind of like focus on the stuff that I, I know pretty well, which is really around scheduling, um, resource control, and, and really leaving security off of the, off of the plate. Um, I did uh, include a couple links here. So hard multi-tenancy. Uh, this is a, a blog by Jesse Frizzell. What, what she's talking about here is like, I've got this pod and this pod. How do I make sure that this pod can't affect that pod? Um, network policies, this is you know, kind of like inside your cluster firewalls between pods. Um, so, so really I, I decided to just kind of leave anything security related off, you know, off the plate here. We're gonna talk about access control, um, which, which there's some elements of security there, but I've left those off the plate and we're really gonna focus on access control, and then those, those nodes and handling workload across those nodes. Um, <clears throat> just a quick couple slides on, on multi-tenancy. Um, so I, I actually took this, this quote here uh, from a, a talk by Amit uh, Balkin, um, and, and I like it. Uh, pro, you know, so what is multi-tenancy in Kubernetes? Uh, providing isolation and fair resource sharing between multiple users and their workloads within a cluster. Um, one note that I would put on this, though, is that fair resource sharing. If we go back to my example applications, like that, that pink application was so super critical that I don't want fair resource sharing across those. I actually want that pink application to have dibs on memory and CPU. So, you know, I like the, I like the statement. I'm just going to tweak it a little bit and say fair resource sharing unless I don't want it to be fair, unless I want to give priority to something, and we'll see how to do that. Um, note on what do, I, what do I mean in this talk by tenant? This is not just like users or groups, we also mean applications. So what is a multi-tenant cluster? In my opinion, it's a cluster where we've got multiple users working on it, multiple groups working in it, or just multiple applications. And then options for multi-tenancy. There's probably more, I'm sure there is, but there's, Two big ones that I think as an industry we focus on right now, and, and they're pretty self-evident. Um, and 
I will actually just go into each one of those individually. So option one is to build an individual cluster per tenant, whether that's a user, a group, or an application. Uh, so each one of these boxes now represents a whole cluster, and you can see now my critical application has its own cluster, and, and all I run on that cluster is that application. Uh, so there are some pros here, um, you know, physical or hypervisor level isolation. Again, I'll refer you back to Jesse's blog to kind of dig into that a little bit more. And then simple config. Um, in, in, you know, that might not be true if you're building out Kubernetes clusters by hand, but if you're using a cloud provider, I mean, it, it's pretty simple to stand up multiple Kubernetes clusters. Um, but, there, but, but there are a bunch of cons here, and, and this is not the way I would, I mean, this is not what I would look at as the first way to handle multi-tenancy. Uh, and, and, you know, the first there is cluster management overhead. You know, instead of managing one cluster, I'm now managing 50 clusters or whatnot, you know. Um, that's not, that's not going to be fun. And then less efficient use of compute resources. So again, it's that white space. Like in this configuration, like if that's all I need to efficiently run this application, well, now I've just got a bunch of wasted memory and, and, and CPU. And, you know, one of these benefits of Kubernetes is really tightening down our spend and making sure that we're using like every byte of memory and every bit of CPU that we can like squeeze out of those clusters. And then the third bullet point here on cons is lack of uh, shared assets. And there's, there's probably a bunch more. I just wanted to call it the, the, the high level ones. And what I mean by shared assets is if you've worked with Kubernetes, there's these, you've got these concepts of secrets, um, you know, storage. I mean, there's these things that we build into a cluster. And if I've got a secret that I use across all these applications, I'm going to need to you know, host that secret in each one of these clusters. So you just kind of lose some of that benefit of having everything all together. And then the second one is a single cluster for multiple tenants. Uh, pros, less cluster overhead. I'm managing one cluster. Uh, and actually, before I go into, the, into the, the pros and cons. And so in this configuration, what we do is we create namespaces. And a namespace is just kind of like a unit of virtual isolation within the cluster. And we'll actually look at uh, namespaces and, and controlling access to namespaces. Uh, so less cluster overhead, uh, role-based access control for access management. So I can give a specific user or service account or application access to the red namespace, but no access to the rest of them. Uh, more efficient use of resources. So now I've got multiple applications on this single cluster. I can try to start filling all that white space. And then access to shared resources. Uh, cons may not be isolated enough. Again, I'll put you back to Jesse Frizzell's blog. Um, and then the overhead of RBAC. Um, I don't know if that's a con or not, but uh, uh, I mean, there is a, a learning curve to start writing RBAC policies in, in Kubernetes. It's, again, you know, most of this stuff is done in YAML. Like, as an industry or as, as like, Kubernetes adoption is growing, you know, I, I think the next thing we're recognizing is that YAML is not always easy to write. So I'm sure we'll start seeing tooling coming out to help us with things like RBAC. But right now, um, I know I've had some frustration when I'm trying to write complex RBAC policies. Uh, it, it is what it is at this point. So that's multi-tenancy. Uh, let's talk about identity and access. And I'm going to speed this up a little bit <laughs> or we're not going to make it. So um, within Kubernetes, you know, when, I, when I think about identity and access, I'm thinking about two things. First thing is authentication. And that is like uh, Kubernetes validating that I'm real. Um, in, in within Kubernetes, we've got two uh, concepts of identity. The first one is service accounts, and these are built into Kubernetes. So you can actually create a service account in Kubernetes, like kubectl create service account or something like that, or have a, a YAML file that will create you a service account. And this is a piece of identity that you can use to run to power things like pods or the Kubernetes dashboard, and you can actually use it for users, but it's not optimal. Second one would be users or groups. These are not built into Kubernetes. So Kubernetes has a pluggable um, authentication system built into it. And um, I'm gonna do a demonstration here in just a moment where we'll, we'll see Azure Active Directory plugged into Kubernetes. Uh, there are blogs out there for using like GitHub as an identity mechanism for Kubernetes. The big point is that you cannot create a user in the Kubernetes uh, etcd database. Like Kubernetes doesn't have this concept of user you can create. It's a pluggable system. Um, RBAC. So, so once we've, you know, once we've authenticated, then the, the next piece is authorization. So 
Kubernetes recognizes you're a real user, but now what do you have access to? And this is done uh, with RBAC. I've got some, uh, some YAML here. Don't worry about it. We're actually going to dig into it in a demo. But when creating RBAC policies, there's two things that we need to do. The first one is configure a role. And this is where we're actually defining what um, the, the user or the identity has access to, what namespace, what type of objects, pods, services, uh, deployments, and then what verbs that that user has access to run against those objects. Create, delete, get, list. Uh, so once we've defined what the role is, we then need to bind that to a user. And that's, that's a role binding, and that's all it is. Uh, take this role and bind it to that user or that group. All uh, that said, let's, get, let's jump into a demo, and we'll see that in action. So I'm going to do my best here. I know it's kind of tight in there. Uh, but so I've uh, deployed a Kubernetes cluster into Azure in AKS cluster. Uh, and I've done nothing else. So we're brand new. So let's hope it all worked out. So I'm running command az AKS list output table. This is just the Azure CLI. There's my cluster. I don't have any like, I haven't like connected uh, kubectl, which is the command line for Kubernetes, on my system to that cluster. So I'm just going to copy that name out. And then I'm going to do az aks git credentials. Uh, name. Group. So I'm basically just grabbing from my AKS cluster um, credentials to uh, authenticate kubectl with, that, uh, with the cluster. I'm going to run it again with dash dash admin. All right. So what, what happened, what just happened is I downloaded two contexts from that cluster, uh, regular and then dash dash admin. And you can lock this down so users can't pull down the admin one. But basically, this context right here is a cluster admin has rights to everything on that cluster. I just did this for, for, for quick demonstration purposes. Um, so now I can do things like, um, and I've got some aliases set up, like kubectl git pods, all namespaces. So as the admin, I've got access there. All right. Let's switch to my non-admin context here. And this is, this is like so super cool. So I'm going to do kubectl git pods, all namespaces. And if you've used like the Azure CLI, maybe you've seen this process. But it, it's now saying like, hey, you're non-admin, but I don't know who you are. I need you to authenticate to this cluster right now. Um, and, and we do that through kind of the, the typical Azure Active Directory authentication. So open up a browser and drop in this code. So I'm going to do that. Let me grab this code here. And I've got a couple things pre-set up in Azure Active Directory to facilitate this. We'll take a look at those. Right, continue. And then it should prompt me and say, OK, who do you want to log in as? I'm going to grab this account right here, Rebecca at nepeters.com. Uh, that's my daughter's name. Go ahead and sign in. So I've been authenticated against Azure Active Directory. There's a, a complex configuration going on in the background that I won't get into. But it should come back and say, all right, we have now authenticated you. However, this account, RebeccaNPeters.com, basically doesn't have access to pods at the cluster scope. Like, we've done nothing to give this account access to the cluster. And that's where RBAC comes in. So I'm going to do a couple things with this manifest file. The first thing I'm going to do is create a namespace. Like, here's my goal. It's like, all right, cool. I want to give this user full access to a single namespace. So I'm going to create a namespace with the name of LOB, line of, app, uh, line of business applications. I'm going to create a role uh, that has access to all resources with all verbs. So just like total admin of that namespace. I'm then going to create a role binding between that role 
and this group. And you can see here I've got a big long GUID, nine, starts with 979. If I go back to Azure, I'll click on Azure Active Directory, click in Groups. I've got a group here, Kubernetes Line of Business, and you'll see that it has an ID that matches that ID that I'm calling out in that manifest file, and then Rebecca is a member of this group. And this is really cool, because now once you have this set up, I can start dropping users into this group in Azure Active Directory, and they're going to inherit those, uh, those permissions granted by the role in the role binding. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, let me see where I'm at here. Just make it easy on myself. I have just some shortcuts so I don't have to type a whole bunch. So I'm running the command uh, kubectl create dash f, and then I'm, oh, I need to actually switch back to my admin account. So I'm creating that namespace, that role, and the role binding. And now if I switch back to uh, Rebecca, or I'm sorry, just the non-admin context, I now have this uh, manifest file here that just contains a bunch of Kubernetes stuff. It's an application, uh, two deployments and two services. Uh, the, the, the contents there don't really matter. So let me go ahead and create that. And what we'll see here is that I still am not good because I have not specified a namespace. I'm trying to create all this stuff in the default namespace. So user Rebecca Peterson cannot create deployments in the namespace default. So really, I just need to run that again and specify a namespace of line of business, or LOB. And boom, there we go. So. Uh, identity integration with Azure Active Directory, uh, access control through, through RBAC. All right, so let's talk about resource control. Um, so resource control, uh, pretty, pretty simple concept. We want to you know, gain control over the usage of resources within our cluster, memory and CPU. Um, and so quite simply, um, and this is not a full manifest file. This is a kind of the container spec within a, a pod. Um, you know, there's a couple things we can do. We can uh, specify requests. And what a request is, it, what a request does is it really influences scheduling. And we're going to talk about scheduling quite a bit. And so what this means is that, like, hey, here's the, you know, I've got, I want to start this container, and I'm requesting this much CPU and this much memory. The Kubernetes schedule is going to kind of, the scheduler is going to look at that and say, all right, I know what you need, and I've got white space for you here that will fit that, you know, you fit this hole, I'm going to put you there. And um, if you've worked with pods, pods can actually contain multiple containers inside of them. So if I'm deploying a single pod, it's going to calculate that request, uh, not just like on an individual container level. So it's going to make sure it can slot that pod. Pretty simple. Influences scheduling. The next one is resource limits. Um, this has nothing to do with scheduling. This is like, all right, I've already scheduled you, but if you hit these limits, do something. Um, and, and that something is, it can be either throttling that CPU down, usage down, or just if you hit the memory limit, it's going to restart, well, it's going to stop the pod. Um, presumably, you're, you're running something called a replica set, um, which once that pod stops, the replica set's gonna say, oh, hey, your application you know, you said you need five of these and we just stopped one. I'm gonna restart one. It will then kick in and say, all right, here's your request. I found a spot for you, let me, let me, let me slot you there. Um, these are like crazy, crazy important. Um, working in Microsoft and in AKS, I mean, we, we've had incidents where, you know, customers go down uh, just because they're not specifying the stuff. So that's, all right, cool. So let's just tell everyone, hey, you must do this. Obviously, that's going, not going to work. Uh, and kind of go into the policy-driven portion of this talk, like how can we enforce this? Like what mechanisms do we have to make sure that we are enforcing resource control? And there's, there's two. And one's kind of like a tough love mechanism, and, and one's more of like we'll help you out. Uh, and the first one, the tough love one, is a resource quota. Uh, so basically, resource quotas, um, it's an object, it's a, it's a type in Kubernetes, and you can create an instance of the type resource quota, 
which basically states like, hey, your pods, uh, it limits resource consumption per namespace. Um, and it denies scheduling if a quota has been consumed or not specified at all. So what this means is like I, right here, I've uh, specified a resource quota. Let's just focus on CPU request.cpu1, so that equates to one CPU. Um, if, you know, we don't have, if you've started several of these and you've hit your quota and you try to start another one, it's just going to deny starting something, starting an additional instance of this pod. Uh, more, I, I guess, kind of the tough lub piece, though, is that when you have a resource quota in place on your pod spec or your container spec, if you don't specify resource constraints at all, it's just going to deny you straight up. Like, hey, you're, you haven't done any of this, so I'm not going to schedule you. Uh, so that's that tough love piece, like, nope, not going to schedule you. Might not want to do that for the pink application, though. You know, like, this thing is so dang critical. Like, if somebody, like, forgets to put resource constraints on it, you know, they hit go, and then they go to lunch, and the resource quota is basically just, like, failed the thing. Our application hasn't started. And that's where limit range comes into place. And limit range is basically, like, you specify, like, here's some default resource constraints. If I don't specify those, it's just going to put those on that, that spec. All right, so let's see these in action. All right, so resource control. I've got a sample here that I was going to start, but in the, for the sake of time, I'm just going to skip it. Um, basically, you can see here I've got requests and limits. You start this pod. You can then go inspect the pod, and you'll see that those limits have been put into place. Next one we're going to look at is resource quota. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a new namespace called gray. Um, I'm creating a resource quota. I'm then going to start two pods. And you can see on my first pod here, I've actually given it a name that has the word limits in it. And I've, I've specified some resource uh, requests, uh, requests and limits on it. Then I've got a second one here that has nothing. So I'm going to start this, or I'm going to run this, and we're going to create a namespace. We're going to create the resource quota uh, object. One pod should succeed, because it does have this on it. And then this second pod should fail, because I haven't, um, I haven't put the resource requests on there. All right, so I'm just uh, running the manifest file. And for the rest of this uh, demo, I'm actually going to just use my admin account so I don't have to worry about our back. Run it again. So yep, so the namespace gray was created. The resource quota was created. The first pod was created. But then the second one failed. And you can see the failure message is must specify CPU and memory. So I'm enforcing that via policy, kind of like the hard love there. Um, something I didn't talk about, though, is this piece right here. Notice I was able to specify CPU, memory, and then pods. So it's not just about limiting how much the, the memory and CPU usage, but I can also, with this object, say, and you can only run five instances of this pod. So I'm actually going to go create a second pod. Again, it's the... It, I have everything specified, so everything looks good. But it's, I'm going to get denied. And the message here is that basically, you know, requested pods one, used pods equal one. This is basically saying, like, hey, you're already using your quota of pods. You started one of these. That's all I want you to run. You're done. And then finally, we've got resource limits. Uh, same thing. I'm going to create a new namespace, pink. Again, I don't think I want to, like, be tough on that pink application. Like, if somebody forgets to put that stuff on it, I still want it to go through. I just want to bring something on after the fact. I'm creating a limit range. Here's my limits. And then I'm creating a pod. And we can see that I've got nothing specified on the pod. It created. Now, if I do kubectl describe pod and grab the name of this pod here. Oop. 
I didn't specify the namespace. I can actually scroll through here and see that limits and requests were placed on it and, and they match what was specified in my um, limit range object. So this is pretty dry stuff. Is that all right? I mean, this is insightful. I mean, it's dry, but it, I mean, these are, like I said, this is like going a little bit beyond hello world, just really want to think about how we protect our clusters and, and protect ourselves from ourselves. Uh, so the next thing is Kubernetes scheduling. So what the scheduler is in Kubernetes, it's uh, just a piece of compiled code that is responsible for placing workload on nodes. Um, it's got some non, like, like out of the box, you know, it's got some algorithms that look at the resource requests, looks at the white space, and places stuff on nodes based on, on that algorithm. It also has some non-default modes. Um, as well, you can create your own custom schedulers. Um, it's my favorite part of Kubernetes. If you want to talk about scheduling in Kubernetes, come find me. Uh, it's a, a weird, <laughs> weird topic to be attracted to, but I, I love the scheduler. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and, it, and, and it's in these non-default scheduling configurations that we can really start thinking about uh, kind of going back to that first slide, like how do I influence where stuff gets scheduled? Like, you know, hey, I, I know I want one cluster, but I'll just throw out a scenario there, then we'll, then we'll walk into the details. I know I want one cluster, but within that cluster, and I know I need a namespace for pink, but I also just want to take one or two nodes of that cluster and reserve those just for pink. Or you know, make sure that like red doesn't accidentally get on these nodes. Um, so let's look at some some different ways in which we can influence the scheduler. And there's three that we're going to look at: um, node name, and I'll, I'll probably skip that demo. Uh, node selector, and then taints and tolerations. Um, so basically, with with node name, we can just specify like, hey, put this work on that node. Not very helpful. Um, you know, it, it, there there might be some edge cases where you want this. Even more helpful though is node selector. And so what we can do is we can actually la add labels to our nodes and then say, hey, I want this container, this pod to be scheduled on any node that matches this, that has this label on it. Uh, it's kind of the canonical example is, is SSD. Like I've got a big cluster and on these five nodes I have SSD drives, the rest I don't. And I wanna make sure that this you know, high performant workload always gets on these nodes with SSD drives. Label them with SSD and boom, there you go. And then taints and tolerations, and this is kind of the one I want to focus on, and I'm actually probably just gonna uh, just do this demo. And, and how this works is we can taint a node. So in this case, I'm gonna taint the node with a key value pair of app equals pink, and there's just a command to do this, and it's almost like a label. And um, once I've put a taint on a node, I can tolerate, I can specify in my pod basically like tolerate this taint. And what that means is that unless you've tolerated this taint, you can't schedule there. Now that doesn't mean that if you're tolerating the taint, you will only be scheduled there. So in this case, pink tolerates this taint, but you can see it's been scheduled across both of these nodes. But red does not tolerate that taint, so it's only scheduled here. So in this case, it'd be like, hey, for our critical workload, make sure you're always tolerating this key value pair, and you will be the only workload that gets scheduled on this node. So this is the way to protect this node from unwanted workload. And we can see, so you know, kind of have reserved this node just for that workload. So let's see that in action. I'm gonna skip the, uh, the other two, just in the sake of time. I mean, they're, they're like super simple. We'll look at the YAML really quick. So I've got a deployment here that doesn't have a node specified. I've got a second deployment here that specifies node name and then that and the name of the node. That second deployment would only get scheduled on that node. Node selector, here's how you create the label. kubectl, label nodes, the name of the node and the label that you wanna put on it. So in this demo, I would have uh, labeled two with disk type SSD, ran this deployment which has 10 replicas in it and added a node selector of disk type SSD, it would only schedule across those two nodes and not the third one. And then the fun one is, is this uh, demo right here. So I'm going to taint this node. 
So kubectl taint nodes, the name of the node, so dash two, then I'm giving it just a, a key value pair there. Boom. And so now I've got a deployment here, non-tolerated. Uh, I've just put a name in there that will kind of help us indicate where stuff is at. Replica's 10. And then I've got no toleration on it. And then tolerated, replica's 10. And you can see down here I've got this tolerations. Key is department, value is IT. So that was created. So if I do kubectl get pods, I've got 20 running, or creating, uh, that's okay. Actually, I'm gonna do uh, kubectl get pods dash o, uh, no, dash wide, nope. Sorry about this. Having a yep, that's what it was. It's going to show me the list of nodes. Let me just clean this up so it's easier to read. So I can see that everything's running. But if I look at non-tolerated, you can see it's on one and one and zero only. But if I look at tolerated. It's across one, zero, and two. So we basically protected node two to just those, those pods. Um, I'm going to just not even jump back into my slides. I can do this one without a slide. The last thing is priority. We talked about this up front. We might get into a situation where, like, OK, that pink workload is like so super critical that um, let me just do some cleanup real quick. I want to remove that taint because I need that node. And let me remove all of those pods as well because I need all my white space back. All right, so we might get in a situation where we want to give higher priority to that pink workload so that if, if my clusters is totally consumed, and the way the scheduler works is if those requests, like if it can't schedule something, it doesn't just like say, oh, I can't schedule you, so I'm done with you. That work actually will sit there in a pending state, and the schedule kind of works on an iterative loop, and it will try to schedule that work until the point that it can. So if it can't schedule something, it will just sit there and retry. We might get in a situation where like, hey, this is like super critical, and if you can't schedule it, I want you to start shutting down non-critical work to make space for this. And we can do that with something called a priority class. So here I'm creating an instance of an object called priority class with a value of 1 million. Uh, four, one. And then I'm going to slam my cluster. So I've got a, a deployment with three replicas and a CPU request of one. So uh, each node in my cluster has one CPU. So I'm going to use all of them. Oh, you got to be kidding me. All right. So I can see that I've got three containers that are starting up. So now I've got a pod, and I've got CPU and limits on it. And what's going to happen here is that we can see that it stays in a pending state. Uh, basically, it can't schedule. And if I was to go describe that pod, there would be an event in there that basically says, hey, there's no, there's no CPU left for you. I can't schedule you. And again, it's just going to sit there like that. Um, finally, I've got the exact same thing. However, I've specified a priority class in the spec. And this is like so, this is so cool. Four, four. All right, so I've created that. Now if I do kubectl get pods, 
you can see that, in, I mean, it actually happened so fast that we didn't get to see it, but it's actually creating that container. And if we look back at the first set of three consume CPU, notice that one's now pending. So what happened is that priority class, it killed one of those containers. It actually just, I mean, did deleted it. Those three have a replica set controlling it, and it's like, in the replica set it says, I need three replicas. So they tried to restart one, but it can now not restart because we've consumed the CPU with the introduction of this priority pod here. But we were able to start that because it had that priority class listed on it. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is just like, there's a lot of, we did a lot of policy stuff here. Um, a lot of that was manual through YAML. Um, Azure just released a tool that's kind of a, a policy management tool. And I think this is like the next iteration of what we're going to start seeing is like unified tools so that I don't have to go create a priority class and resource limit, you know, quotas individually, kind of unified tooling to help us build this policy and apply it to our clusters. So, um, you know, be on the lookout for, for that type of tooling coming forward. I hope this was helpful. Thanks a lot. And I'll be around all day. Do we, do we have time for questions? We could probably do uh, one or maybe two quick questions. Any questions? There's one over here. I'm just curious about this new tool. Yep. Um, is there any uh, news about it, or is this already available in preview? It's, uh, it's already available. I mean, it's, it's an open source tool. I'll pull it up right now. I'd intended on doing this. So it is uh, Azure Kubernetes Policy Controller. Uh, total open source. I mean, this was released like days ago. Uh, I haven't even played with it yet. But but really, it's using a standard uh, open source policy management language to, to write policies, apply them to your cluster so you're not having to go and inject all that stuff into the YAML. Thanks for the question. Prompted me to pull this up, which I wanted to do. Anything else? Awesome. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Yeah.